so yeah, so let's go uh, into the chat. Uh, if you guys could tell us where you're from and on a scale of one to 10, um, how amazing Dale's hair is. Um, I, you know, okay, but really the- uh, what, wait, One wait. to 12, one to 12, yeah. Barry. One to 12, all right. Dan said 11, perfect. All right, so um, we're here to talk about CRMs and we have the 10 commandments that Dale and Dan have both come up with. Uh, Dale is the owner, operator, chief instructor of Smart Insider, brilliant ISA coach. Uh, he did not pay me to say that. Uh, Dan is the, are you the co-founder or founder of Follow Up Boss? Founder and co-founder, I guess. So it's the <laughs> you can't co-founder. Sure. You yeah. partnered with yourself then? Is that what happened? You were just in front of a mirror and... <laughs> No, I've got a great partner, Tom. So he's he's okay. more on the technical side. Yeah, co uh, No, that's good. Dan uh, is the pretty face of Follow a Boss. That's the, yeah, that's Follow a Boss. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, would you guys agree that um, not using your CRM well is a common problem for agents? I think that's for you, Dan. Oh, uh, one. yeah, Either totally. One. I, I was just looking at the chat. Yeah, a few people were just in there, Teresa, or me just saying yes. Yeah, so I, I think people get overwhelmed for sure when they buy a new CRM. And then I think, you know, people also come in with a lot of experience, probably with a CRM they maybe used like five to 10 years ago that really required a lot of manual data entry and stuff like that. So right. I, I think, you know, the joke is about Salesforce, right? It's called Salesforce because you have to force your agents to use it. <laughs> and so like yeah. that's the whole approach i guess is to just think like a crm is there to help you grow your business and, th and that's what we're trying to make easy for us is we're not trying to force you to do it right and if you ha you are having to force someone to do it um th there's kind of a problem so yeah we're just we're just trying to help people make more sales at the end of the day but i yeah. think for a lot of people it's very intimidating right and it's intimidating even as a team leader to say hey i need you to do it this way hey we need to do it um like this and then i know like obviously you run one of the best teams in the country barry and then dale is very involved on the coaching side and then obviously it, when people are using the tools it, it's a lot easier to run your team or a lot easier to actually coach people because you can see what they're saying you can listen to their calls all that kind of stuff so yeah it's definitely a big problem though we still see it for sure yeah. um dale and, and your coaching clients whether it be an individual agent a team or an isa you're finding that this is a big topic as well just how to use it any crm really not just follow up boss yeah I, I would say that um obviously there's you know you you as dan pointed out you know barry your your team and uh, other people like trish tristan like serious practitioners that are really dialed things in you know right. you're really at the top end where that crm uh is driving when used properly is driving the daily activity of your agents or your ISAs. The next step below that is where they're kind of utilizing it in that way, but they're still having to kind of force the machine. And it's like a, an administrative task that isn't, you know, it's like an afterthought or a, well, I'm doing sales activity. And then I go to the CRM versus the CRM being my sales activity and driving it. And then there's the people way down at the bottom where they haven't even got, you know, it's kind of like, their CRM, if they have one, is like the shoe box of old pictures that's under their bed and has some people in it and they don't really do much with it, right? So yeah. those, are the, those are the different levels of people that we work with in my company. Yeah, no, and I think that uh, this is why, you know, a, a common joke is like, I wanted, at one point I wanted to get a shirt that said like LCA, what which CRM is best? Like I just wanted a shirt that said that. You know what I mean? Like I think it'd be funny because that's a common, you know. And everybody's it's probably the most popular post, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah a, exactly. The one right. question that gets asked the most: Why am I here? What's the best CRM? So who came up with this list of ten? Was it a, a project between? Um, yeah, uh, the this was a collaboration where you know. I said, you know, from my experience coaching and training, Dan said, from my experience of building the best CRM in the in the industry, this is what we run into and and what they'd want people to know. All right. Well, uh, why don't we start with number one? And I don't know who wants to kick it off, but uh, uh, thou shalt not thou shalt prioritize your follow up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll take this one. And, in, in this, you know, one of the issues uh, that one of the first things we have to teach ISAs and teach agents when we're giving them leads and trying to help them prioritize things, because 
if you're, if you're just working sphere business, right, which is a fantastic business to work, but it's not as intense. You have a much higher conversion rate when you're talking to people who know, like, and trust you. Anytime you're mixing in advertising and you're buying leads or you're, uh, you know, forcing registration or whatever, internet leads, uh, you have to make a lot more outreaches and have a lot more conversations with people in order to convert business, which means that if you only have eight hours in your day, you need to be more prioritized in terms of who you're talking to and who you're reaching out to. The other thing is I, I see this with really inexperienced people that are using a CRM or uh, someone who has just hired, say, their first ISA or whatever it is. Uh, that ISA inadvertently can end up calling a few leads a thousand times and only having called one lead once or not at all, right? And so the prioritization and the organization isn't there. And so you just have to be smart about who you're going to talk to, when you're going to talk to them, and have a process that you go through from new lead to recent lead to cold lead. And then as we pointed out here, and, and, and I know you, Barry, do this a lot, right, it is relying on who's being most active right now, right? Yeah. Where's, the, where's, the, where's the smoke? That's where the fire is. Yeah, well, I think that remarketing um, in, uh, in, in just the fact that as, an, as a small business owner, I can keep the consumer's attention um, uh, has required me to change my workflow and level of organization. And one thing that I really appreciate about what Follow Boss has done is they've rec not only recognized that this was a, an entirely new workflow of the old contacts coming back, but, you know, they've given us deeper insights and analytics around that whole, um, whole, whole topic. Um, let's see. So Dan, do you want to go to number two or I don't know? Yeah, just, I just say what, like one last thing is like, yeah. even if you know how to prioritize as sort of like the team leader or whatever, like the, the mistake you can make is thinking that everyone in your team knows how to. And <laughs> I, I just like, you know, yeah, like our minds work very different probably to a lot of people who are in our sales teams or agents in our team. And so just keep that in mind. So I think it's really important to go through uh, this with people and then just so they don't get overwhelmed and, and so that they can actually like be as effective as possible with their time. Sort of like Dale was saying, but uh, yeah, just don't assume. And I think it would be good to like always, always just make sure that people are doing it in the, in the you know, kind of most efficient way possible. Well, and I think, you know, I've, thought a lot about this with working on training and stuff. Um, and I think that in a real estate business, there's the people whose job is in front of a computer versus the people whose job is at the house. And that changes everything about how they engage the CRM. Um, but that's actually why I love SmartList. Um, you know, that to me, you know, they're saved search filters. And uh, I decided that I would create my follow-up based on, um, you know, these lists. So basically like every day they go through a set, set number of searches and the last communication column, Dale, how do you feel about that? So a lot of my lists, when my agent does reach out, the name disappears for X amount of time, however long based on the list. Like, are there any other, um, other than recent activity, do you use last communication? Is that, do you think that's a good idea or should we avoid that? Uh, no, I, I do think it's a good idea, especially if you're if you have your agents consistently making contacts in the system, and if they are doing, uh, let's say blind. I'm just going to say I'm going to call it blind follow-ups, right? Where we don't have a planned time to talk, and I'm just doing outreach for the sake of doing outreach. Then that is a really good way to do it. The only other way to do it is if you're if you're well dialed in enough on your nurtures to the point that every follow up you make was a predetermined or agreed to uh, communication, then you don't rely on that quite as much. But I mean, that there's very, there's very few teams out there that are, are at that level. And usually that's going to be run by an ISA team, right? Where you, you can have, you can't really dial agents in that tight. So blind follow up versus I, I, I was going to I'm going to type it in the chat for everybody, because I think that's a really good distinction when you're prioritizing blind follow up versus was it I know nurture was it dialed yeah, in nurture a, a pre a predetermined touch right a predetermined uh, agreed upon communication like hey, uh, you know what we're going to talk in a couple of weeks when you find out whether your that settlement comes through or uh, when your mom gets uh, an answer as to whether she can list the house. 
So then for this first one, guys, uh, this is a huge, I think, take home. When you're prioritizing, you can, you can look at it from two vantage points is I don't want to not follow up with my new leads. And then I think uh, nurture is a huge, huge vacancy. Like the agents just aren't doing enough of it. Um, they're collecting lots of new, right? right? But then the ones they collected, they're like, ah, I won't mess with those. And actually, I don't mean to be talking so much, but I'm really interested in the subject. Um, I had an ISA, she's doing it right now. I said, go through our cold list and do a client care check-in. How's your agent? how they do? Oh do yeah, huge. They will tell that ISA so many things they won't tell your agent. And we've saved so many deals by doing that to where you get the consumer to complain to you about how that agent sucked or what they didn't do, even if it's ridiculous. Right. And you either say, as you know, the the manager, you're like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna comp your meal, ma'am. I'm so sorry about that, right? right. Or you or you move them to another one, and, and you can literally save so many deals that way. That's a great idea, Barry. Well, I mean, as of right now, all I'm doing is finding out. Uh, I think we've got I'm at 15 people that have already bought a home that wasn't with my agent, so it's kind of depressing right now. But hopefully, we can. <laughs> That's definitely going to help. I think we saw a chat message about what's an ISA. ISA is an inside sales agent. So essentially, they're just a dedicated salesperson who doesn't actually, thanks, Jake, who doesn't go out and uh, show homes. They don't list homes. They are like the air traffic controller at the airport. They're not in the plane. They're in the tower, uh, you know, controlling things in terms of the leads and then pushing that out to the pilots who are the outside agents. All right, point number two. Thou shalt leverage call routing and dialers. This is a big one. Who wants to, yeah. who wants to take this one first? Go ahead, Dan. Tell us, to you tell, why don't you tell us about the tech and then I'm gonna tell you what, what that means for us lay people. Sure, yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that we've really tried to do in Follow Boss is bring everything together. So we really, I think it's really important to think about how calls are coming into your business. Like what's your answer rate? Um, what happens if someone leaves a voicemail? What happens if someone you know, calls you, it's a missed call, but they don't leave a voicemail. I think in a lot of businesses, those things fall through the cracks. And so, you know, we have, we have tech and features to handle all that inbound call routing. Um, so I just think that's very important to, to think about whether you're using us or using someone else. I can almost guarantee you, you don't have a good system for returning missed calls. Um, and then the second part is like the dialers, which just means like, you know, using the CRM to make outbound phone calls, which is really important for coaching and then also accountability. We also have some features in there like leaderboards and things like that. So you can really like, you know, make it competitive with your sales team. So, um, but yeah, the coaching aspect again is something which it, it's a little bit less about obviously technology, but you need, to, you need to record the calls to really be able to give that coaching or be listening live. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really what a big opportunity and just the last thing i would say is like obviously people calling in like they're your very best lead they've already seen your marketing they probably already have looked up your reviews that's really like a i think google calls it like the moment of truth and and that's where like you've got to be answering those calls so huge yeah definitely huge i, I want to talk about the recording thing so if you want to improve what your agents are doing, what your ISAs are doing, what you are doing as a salesperson, you have to watch your game tapes. You have to listen to what came out of my mouth and why did I do that? And it will help you improve drastically. And a lot of times when, when you know, we're, we're talking to a, a company that wants help, a team that wants help growing or improving what their agents and ISAs are doing. And they're like, hey, I'm using one of those big top 10 CRMs in the market. And I say, great. You, they don't, and it's not FUB, it's not follow boss. And uh, I say, uh, can you, I need you to record your calls. And they say, well, they don't do that. And I'm like, that's, I, I can't help you. If you can't get call recording, I can't help you. Right. Um, because I can sit here and talk theory all day. I can role play with your people all day and they'll be amazing. They'll sound great. They'll nail it. And then they get on the phone and they screw it up and they have to hear themselves screw it up. And that's the only way to improve. It makes massive impact that way. Uh, and, and having a, 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 you know, a CRM like this that allows you to, for the call routing to be able to send those calls to where they need to go to, lots of teams have different structures. And, and most teams don't have 24-hour coverage by salespeople. It, right. it, it, it really doesn't happen that often. So 
where do those calls go? How do they get captured? As Dan was saying, a lot of places don't have, a lot of teams don't have a good process for missed calls. Um, and so having that kind of call routing or, you know, uh, with if everything has to go to your busy outside agents too, if you're stuck with that setup, they're showing houses. They're they're screwing around with frozen lock boxes, or they're standing in line at the grocery store picking their kids up. Like it's just not a good time. And you have to be able to control what happens with those calls. So that's an important thing to leverage. And then dialers being able to just not having to punch numbers in, right? If if the pickup rates are going down, if you have to make more attempts to talk to people, you just have to be faster and just simply getting rid of punching in the numbers between each call can speed you up and help you make the contacts that you need to make. So those are all super important tools to use. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know a lot of agents that really don't like to listen to themselves. I don't like to listen to myself. I used to Um, hate the sound of my voice. Yeah. Well, it's the inner ear versus the outer ear. You know, what we hear ourselves, it just sounds different. Um, but you know, it, it's how you level up. It's how you get better. So I thought that was a great point. And in our culture, if you pick up the phone to call the business, you're ready to spend some money. You're ready to transact. And, and so routing those calls, super important. This is a really, really good point. And, um, call list also, I, I like, you know, cause I get distracted, but if I can do, if I can drill down and find 10 people, create a list and then just focus on those 10 people until I finish, I'm going to get more done. So yeah, super, that's, super. you know, uh, Barry in, in, uh, in running, as I'm sure, you know, as running teams, whether inside or outside, a lot of time gets wasted when they're sitting around figuring out who should I call, right. And trying to piece that together, uh, that all that time just gets burned. And now the name of the game now is making, having conversations, whether it's phone, text, email, social media message, whatever it is, having those communications, not figuring out who to call. Yeah. And, and then when they're doing that, uh, they find themselves memorizing everything about the lead, right? Cause they're <laughs> nervous and they think somehow if they know every neighborhood and street that they looked on, they're somehow not going to sound stupid. Um, and, and then the person doesn't answer or respond. Right. And so I just, you know, um, I always tell people the activity box and follow a boss you guys should move that to the top, Dan, just like by default. I think I don't think it's at the top right now. It's in the bottom right, but you can move them around. And man, that that box is super. Do you do you teach that, Dan? Like, are Dale um, uh, using that activity box for no. conversation? No. No. Tell us about it. Um, so. And not to say that I don't agree. I haven't leveraged that yet. I'd like you to show us. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Um, so let's see. So when you just click on a prospect, um, you can this box right here. So when you're, let's see, hold on a second. Can't see it because the thing's in the way. <laughs> All right, there you go. You can see it. So, so basically, like it just gives you kind of instead of memorizing everything. Okay, this person answered the phone. Are you still looking for around a three hundred thousand dollar house? three bedroom, two bath, you know, and, and it's always at the bottom. And so you gotta, you gotta, I always tell my agents when they start a new account, like get it at the top. It's super important. Prioritize yeah. it. And, and even if you, you know, like it doesn't like, it, it doesn't hurt to put it there because uh, there will be times in conversations where you can work it in. Maybe you can't, uh, but it doesn't matter because whatever the thing that was there isn't going to help you in your conversation anyway. So you might as well put that data there. And that's great that they can just be moved around. Yeah, no, it's really, really slick. Okay, I this this third one, man, gives me anxiety if it's not handled right. So I'll let you guys know <laughs> what this one. <laughs> oh, man. I, I would say that uh, very often when I start working with a company, they either have zero use of a CRM and the people have s- sticky notes everywhere or they have a CRM that is so, it, it has like, it, it has anxiety. The CRM has anxiety because there's like 5,000 overdue tasks, right? And and everything was tasked upon, like uh, there's a task to wake up uh, each day and there's a, or there's a task that you should call your new lead, which drives me nuts, right? 
If I have to teach an agent or an ISA to call a new lead, we have a problem. If I have to task you to do that, we have a problem here. Uh, so the point is, yeah, there you go. Before uh, file boss, I was horrible and killed myself with tasks. Yes, what happens is, is if you over-program your tasking and you don't rely on the other tools that are inside your CRM to make a logical process for using that powerful tool, it will become bloated and useless. And then your agents will sit around and be like, ah, I don't know, I, I didn't call anybody. I, I, I'm so overdue. It's like that really long to-do list that you end up never getting anything done on. It's just too much and it becomes confusing and bloats the system. Yeah, bloating. That's a good word for it. Dan, do you see this a lot with uh, follow boss users? Yeah, I think we've done a lot of education on using smart lists and things. So now I think a lot of people are kind of like recovering task, you know, problem people. Uh, I definitely you guys, still make you need a focus. You need a focus group, Dan, where people can talk about their overtasking. I know. Yeah, it would be good. And I guess the way I always sort of explain to people is like, hey, the thing is, if you go on holidays or you're you're busy for the weekend doing showings or whatever, like your CRM is going to be there tasking you, tasking you, tasking you. You're never going to get ahead of that. And it's just it's just not a great way to be. And then I think the other thing, it just goes back to point one is you've got to prioritize. And the biggest thing we see is when you have like 5,000 tasks and you don't know what's a priority. So, um, yeah, I just use tasks like very sparingly. Um, definitely not for your like lead follow-up cadences. Like that's where we, we will build smart lists and like we've been talking about, they're just sort of like safe filters. So yeah, that's the way. That way you can dynamically say like, hey, show me the people most recently on my site, things like that. So that, yeah. yeah. No, I like it. I like it. And, you know, I don't know if I should say this, but my, I actually went to Wailopo and had them turn off the task for priority alerts for my team. So like, you know, cause normally if there's something big happens an auto task creates and I was like, you know what? I actually want my agents to use tasking. Let's test. I, we're testing it for 30 days where we don't, where we're, we've quieted this section of the CRM because it's like, it's task hell. If you want to, if you want to feel like a failure, go to your task section and see how horrible you are. You know, that's basically <laughs> what's going on. That's funny. <laughs> but, that, uh, that makes sense. Uh, you know, it is it, uh, half, I would say half of like the success is, the activities that you do and the skills that you have, the other half of it is your mindset. And if you're agents who already are reluctant to do outreach to people and hear no, uh, and use a system that takes thinking, and then on top of it, it is like emotionally damaging for them to see <laughs> how bad they've been. Uh, it, it just puts, it puts negative pressure on their mindset and their ability to what they're supposed, what, what the best case scenario is, is that they're personally connecting to, building rapport with, relationship with, and uh, securing business from other consumers, right? And so all that other noise, just it, it just puts downward pressure on it. Yeah, and uh, when I started having the workflow be based off of smart lists instead of tasks, I noticed that the logical side of my agent's brain wasn't having to be used as much. They could stay creative and use their sense of humor. And I've watched incrementally their follow-up time in one sitting has gone up because they're not taxing themselves with, okay, who's next and where's this task? And it's just creative, 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 which is what we need them to be, right? We need them shaking yeah. hands and kissing babies. Right, exactly. Um, okay, so notes. So then are we not supposed to be using tags like, they love chocolate ice cream. Is that not a tag? Should they make that <laughs> note? Dan? Interesting, because I think some of our clients do both. I think you could have an ice cream tag. This person really likes ice cream. Um, okay. one, of, one of our clients out in uh, California, he tags everyone by like the type of alcohol they like, things oh. like that. Just so like when he's, you know, I guess when he's sending out gifts. But, you know, again, like that info could definitely be in the background or notes as well. It's not necessarily a tag. Um, Honestly, this is one of the things when I log in and I look at someone's CRM, this is kind of a, you know, this tells you everything, right? If you're just seeing like leads coming in, because obviously we automate that, leads are going to come in, the leads, um, you know, but if you're seeing notes, so if I'm looking at like, for example, a Wailopo customer and, you know, they've got a ton of notes from the agent or the ISA, it's like, you know, they're doing the work. If there's no notes and then there's, there's hardly any communication, like, you know, stuff logged, obviously, you know, 
they're not really doing much. So I just think, yeah, I, I mean, this is just a big tell if there's not any notes. And then, um, yeah, obviously it's critical to know for like follow-up conversations and things. If you did speak to someone, I mean, you can't just remember like, you know, all this stuff. So yeah, making sure you put those in is really critical. Yeah, yeah. Dale, yeah, any that's... tips on making these notes? Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, let's talk about this. If Because when we say make notes, right? Uh, <laughs> We've got people who will squeak out a couple of words into their notes. And then you've got people that are telling you what color of drapes the buyer wants to purchase and it's completely irrelevant, right? Or yeah. what their, what their uh, you know, sister-in-law had for lunch last week. Who cares? That has no bearing on them buying or selling real estate. So when it comes to note-taking, one, te come up with a structure. Teach your agents and ISAs a structure. Give them a structure to follow. And the most basic one would be that all notes of anyone that you've spoken to have to have who, where, when, why, what, and how much. And then it also has to include reasons they would move forward, reasons they wouldn't move forward, and leave them with something to start the next conversation with. Okay? Does that, hopefully that all makes sense. Something to start the conversation with? Yep, something that a re, uh, something for to start the next conversation with, i.e. So it doesn't sound like, hey, Barry, this is Dale. Yeah, we talked a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to see if you're ready to buy or, you know, get moved forward. That is not good, right? That's not enough. Right. But uh, if I have in the notes in there, Barry and wife are talking about whether to move forward now or not. Then I can say, hey, Barry, it's Dale. Yeah, we talked a couple of weeks ago, or you talked to my partner a couple of weeks ago, so-and-so. He mentioned that you and your wife were going to be talking about when you'd like to get moved forward, whether it was now or sooner. Just wanted to see how that conversation went. That is a much meatier follow-up, right? That just tells you, start next convo here, if you can do that, or just make something up, right? If you don't have anything that concrete. No, that's actually really helpful because I think sometimes we start all over again. Each call, it's like we don't remember anything. We start all over. And I can't stand it when I call the bank or cable company or something and you tell them your issue and then it's like, oh, okay, hold on a second. And then you transfer and then you have to tell the same story all over again. And that's effectively <laughs> what we're doing with our follow up. It's so frustrating. I always ask them, I'm like, did that last person tell you why I'm here? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Well, guess we're starting that one over. So do you use your Jedi tricks when you call customer service? Just a side note, <laughs> out of curiosity. <laughs> I, I, I try my best, but they seem to thwart my efforts. One of my agents actually is very methodical. He, he prefers not to use auto searches for his leads. He'll, he'll pick them out once he, he talks to them and everything. And every house he sell, uh, sends them, he puts a note. And it's, you'll go and look, and over the course of a year, there's like 60 notes sent wow. one, two, three, mystery. Yeah. Very rhythmic. And I mean, he's crushing it. So, I mean, if I'm you could, if you can figure out how to, how to like ma make a team of, you know, bots that do that, like just to have a yeah. whole room, have an office full of people that can do that. Like you will sell all of the houses. I know. <laughs> That's good. Oh man. Friendly competition. This is going to be interesting to me because I actually don't do this for my agents at all. So I'm very keen to hear what you guys have to offer with thou shall create friendly competition. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say from my experience that I have seen sales teams perform. I've seen sales teams that are completely siloed where agents have no idea what anyone else is doing, how they're doing, where they're at, what's going on with, you know, their peers. Uh, and the performance there is lags behind enormously when you when everybody when it's open right when everybody knows what everybody else is doing there mm. automatically is a sense of natural competition and whether that's i want to be the best so i'm going to work harder or i at least want to be in the middle of the pack and not suck uh, i'm going to do better or oh my god i'm at the bottom i need to pick this up before i get kicked out either way it always causes more and better healthy performance if, as long as you're not beating people up over it, uh, right? But it causes healthy performance, which I, I'm sure you have experienced too. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, and so here's here's an example of that leaderboard that actually does that. Um, oh, you could do deals. I didn't even know that. Um, and I guess you guys ascribe, Dan, certain points to each. Uh, yeah, that's right. So like basically, you know, appointments are the main thing that's going to uh, get you points here, uh, but also activities like calls, texts, uh, and emails. And then there's also uh, at the top left, see how it says activity leaderboard. You can also switch to like transactions because, you know, at the end of the day, like we're trying to sell houses here, right? So that, that will just tell you who's winning on the transaction uh, front versus activity. And so just quickly, like, yeah, we've, interestingly, I've seen this at follow-up boss because we never used to really track how much an individual salesperson uh, was selling because we just kind of like were more in, in like a service mode. Like we didn't really have a sales team with a comp structure. You know, we were just paying people uh, salary and things like that. Um, and so I saw it beforehand. And I think the, the downside of that was just, you didn't really know where you, you stacked up against everyone. And you didn't really know, hey, am I doing a really great job? you know, or I'm like working really hard, but not really getting the results. Like, like, what do I compare to? And, and it's also hard when you just have a small team, like for a long time, we just had like one or two people doing it. So again, there's not much to compare to, but now like we have a really healthy, like competition uh, in, in our sales team. So people are looking at this leaderboard almost every day. You know, I'm like, Oh, wow. Look, he made more calls than me. He had more appointments. And then they're ultimately looking at how many deals they close as well. And I think just from like bringing it back to real estate, because we're a little bit different being a software company, but um, where I've heard it's been really effective is let's say, you know, Annie comes to you, Barry, and says, hey, I'm not really making the, the income that I want to, right? Mm -hmm. Then maybe Let, we let's can- Let's talk about my split. Whoa, yeah. oh, wow. You just, man, you took it to a whole nother level. I'm uncomfortable immediately. <laughs> But this is, and this gives Barry the data. He can then go back and say, hey, look, let's look at how, like, how much activity you're doing versus the people that are at the top, right? And so it's, it helps, I think, to hold up those um, you know, people that are closing the most. And most of the time, they're going to be the people doing the most, right? Like, it's generally how it is. Not always, because sometimes they just have like a really big past client roster and things like that. But yeah, generally, it's the people doing the most, you know, getting the most results. So I, I think it's just really useful for coaching when you're talking to people about what they want to be earning, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I remember talking to one of my agents who um, uh, had great conversations, but it was about the wrong stuff. Like, you know, they talked about what grocery stores they shop at and stuff like that. Um, sh anyway, long and short of it is, um, they said, well, you know, I'm not making enough money. And we went in and we looked and, uh, um, you know, they were just really afraid to make phone calls. And so, um, and that came out by looking at the, you know, the data, the, you know, and um, come to find out, you know, they just, this wasn't the right career for them. But I, you know, I didn't push them out the door, but it made it very easy for them to make that conclusion because when they compared themselves against their peers, it was obvious what was going on. Yep. Um, go ahead, Dale. Uh, that's, uh, you know, for, with the, just for the friendly competition, I just want to reinforce because obviously there's different leadership styles and my personal experience and perspective is the friendly competition there is to show what can be done to show other examples of who's doing what and what can be done and not to be used necessarily as a punishment tool. It should be a fun thing that, uh, is, is, uh, put out to the team to aid those who want to be competitive to, you know, get that exercise in and be competitive, but it's for those other ones who want to improve themselves and don't know how, because as you said, Barry, it came back to the activity. Well, if you're going to look at the top, if you're not the top producer and you're down the totem pole and you're like, they must have something I don't have, but you consistently see that they're making 50% to 150% more sales activity. It's pretty obvious why the results are showing up. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I think a lot of times in real estate, we take a victim mindset, like nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants. And then you look at the person that's just grinding it out and they're crushing it you know this is a contact sport real estate you know you got you just gotta you gotta connect with people um there's yep. some really good questions over here 
Um, let's see, a lot of people saying this is a great, this is amazing, Dale's hair is awesome. Oh, okay. Uh, who has the best cell numbers and emails for skip tracing? Okay, so not necessarily on topic, but uh, I guess while we're here, what is your opinion, Dale? Um, for skip tracing? Yeah. Oh, man, I haven't done that in a whole long time. Not since I was like, I like, a, like Ivy. Yeah, I haven't ever used that. I mean, I haven't done it since I was a ninja expired caller. So I, I can't answer that one. No problem. No problem. Uh, thou shalt not abdicate leadership. Your CRM isn't a replacement for coaching. It's a tool that helps you lead and coach more effectively. I've seen CRMs try to try to coach within it. And it's horribly confusing and annoying. Like, uh, so I'd love to hear why you guys added this one. Uh, I, you know, from my perspective, when we talked about this, and when I say coaching, I mean internal, like as a team leader, as a business structure, not trying to rely on your CRM to, uh, to help your salespeople either know what they need to do to improve their performance or trying to you rely on your CRM to magically cause your salespeople to be more productive is what that's about because it doesn't work that way. You have to be in there to either help them grow in their sales career and what they do, and you can't rely on the CRM to do that for you, or you have to be in there for them to self-discover how they need to change their perspective in order to become the salespeople they want to become. And Unfortunately, your CRM can't do that for you. So the point is, if you give them a fancy, shiny machine and you're like, hey, hey guys, here you go, take that. I'll come back when you make a whole lot of sales. Uh, good luck. It's not going to work that way. Right, right. No, absolutely. It's funny. I, um, I actually think CRM mastery uh, is one of the most important things a salesperson can, um, can learn. Um, you know, obviously I'm not saying, uh, the rest of the job's not important, but man, organizing your, your database is, uh, I think it's going to become really, really important, uh, here in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's now the battle of CRMs because we're all fishing so far upstream, right. Mm -hmm. That, uh, it's, it, it is a, it's a nurturing game. It's a, he who nurtures the most people, the best wins. Yep. And I've noticed, you know, I'm over a hundred thousand contacts now and my CRM follow up boss is not slowing down at all. I don't know how you guys are able to do that, but it Dan, seems like. Tell us how that works. Well, yeah. Once you get to like a million, like Robert Slack, then we have to move you to a different server. <laughs> and it's very technical. I don't understand it. I just know it costs a lot of money, but so um, server, yeah. You have different servers for different, I guess, areas or database sizes yeah yeah it's, it's mostly just once people get too big then they need to go on their own and we only really have um a few clients like that um yeah. but yeah we luckily we've just got some smart engineers on our team again it's sort of not stuff i fully understand but you know we have people that have a few hundred thousand contacts and they can just run on everything and then even your account barry uses a lot of different like api integrations and things obviously like you're using like all the things and so that also i know causes quite a lot of like just just like database load and things like that but yeah. um it's glad to you know glad to hear it's working well and you know when people push those limits like the people with databases of a million plus that's what actually helps make the system faster for everyone else because we go oh, oh no like hey this like million contacts is trying to go through this like little like corridor here for lack of a better analogy and like you know we need to make that corridor bigger or better or whatever and then basically we improve that for everyone at once not just the person with a big account so um, nice. yeah yeah it's not slow at all i've noticed so that's good um thou shalt be a real person this is offensive to me so go ahead <laughs> yeah I, well yeah you barry his you're the you're the bot master but i think yeah. you know i think I think number six and seven kind of go together a little bit. It's like, there's this place for technology and automation and bots, right? And there's this place for being a real person, a real leader and building real relationships. And I think like, I just wanted to speak from the follow-up bus side. We, we do sometimes get those clients coming to us 
And Dale like made this joke before of like, hey, you're just throwing a CRM at them and leads and then hoping they're going to make sales. But like, it does happen. Like, and I think sometimes that's, you know, that person just maybe has hired some of the wrong people or they don't even really have a great plan for how to build a team or they're just learning for the first time how to build a team. And like, you know, I was terrible the first time I built a team, you know, like it's just did a lot of things wrong. And, you know, that's a lot of people make those mistakes, right? And, and so, yeah, I just think, you know, I think you've got to, um, I, I mean, we, we just see some people come and they're just like, hey, yeah, you know, I just want to hook up, follow up boss. I want you guys to do your automatic emails and I want Ray to send out the text and then I don't want to do any work. And it's like, oh, great. <laughs> like, you know, because if you didn't have to do any work, then you would be out of a job, right? So, um yeah, I don't know. You, you, I'd like to hear your thoughts, Barry, on the on the bot side of things and oh, yeah. where I mean, it does and makes. As automated and um, leveraged as I am, it's so that I can focus on what's in front of me. So when I was in production, so when I was selling homes and listing homes, the point of all the automation was not to to use your word abdicate work. It was so that. I could allow all this stuff to show me who I should focus on. And then when I focus on them, they got my attention um, to the point that I have to start using timers. You can't see it. The beep. Yep. Because I'm so focused on what I'm doing with the person that I, I'm like missing out or, you know, going over, over my appointments. And so automation should really be doing that. That's, and, and the problem is for those that aren't using it, they're um they're trying to just do it all and they're horrible at all of it so yeah i would say that you absolutely have to have automation uh and you need to have that kind of leverage uh i think that this one here much more as dan was saying is for those teams who don't want to put in the effort to make really good automation right to really dial in because there's any number of providers that can give you automated things, uh, but you have to tweak the system. You have to be like turning the knobs and dials like you do, Barry. And if you don't do that, if you just bolt something on to the side and you think that that's going to handle, you know, creating relationships for you without you doing any tinkering or playing around with it or, or fine tuning, it isn't going to work that way. Uh, and so, I've seen a lot of situations where someone, uh, you know, a team leader didn't want to put the effort into setting up a really good system. They stuck some things on there and then they complain that it's not doing its job. My agents aren't doing their job. The bots aren't doing their job. None of this stuff works. Okay. Well, that, that the problem is that it, anything that you want, anything good takes work is the problem. So you have to keep yourself real in that situation. And it takes probably even more work. I would, would you agree, Barry, to, to set up and dial in an automated system takes more work to not screw things up than it simply does to be a real salesperson and connect with people. Yeah, I actually don't like setting it up. I, I don't really? enjoy it. Yeah, but I like the dividends, you know. Yeah. One, the stuff I did in 2016 is still saving me time and it just compounds over time. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, I, I think this is an hour, right? So we gotta, we gotta, oh, we, gotta we gotta run through uh, this. Um, tracking your deal sources. You need to hold your marketing spend accountable, track every deal. So you know what to keep in cut. Very interesting. Who wants I think to speak that one's that? pretty obvious to those that perform at a really high level. And, but then again, I mean, I've seen some really big, you know, 800 pound gorillas in their market who can't tell you what their most profitable source is or what their profit margin is on it. They just sell a lot of houses. Uh, right. Um, but here, you know, unless you are the 800 pound gorilla in your market, you, you, you know, we all operate based on income and expenses. And so one of the most important things to do is, is leverage that in your system and know where your spend is having the most efficacy for your company. Yeah, so I'm smiling because I remember it was 2016 and I was the number one team in my market. 
I, I don't remember how many houses I guess we sold like 300 or something, but, and like, I got this really cool trophy and my picture was on the screen for five seconds, literally five seconds. And I wasn't making a lot of money. Everybody else was making a lot of money, but my margins, because the cost per lead on Zillow and realtor.com at the time were so high in my market that, and I was like, all right, that wasn't worth it. <laughs> That wasn't worth it at all. And so that's, that's what like, <laughs> it repivoted my entire focus and how I was going to run my business. Um, uh, and, uh, and Barry, I want to say this, you know, it sounds kind of dumb that we talked about this, but you can't be an idiot and sell 300 houses a year. You have to have smarts. You have to have an organization. Like you, you don't sell 300 houses a year because you, you aren't a good business person. Right. Uh, Right. It takes business acumen to make that happen. And even at that point, you didn't know that it wasn't terribly profitable and you had to figure that out. So right. I know that sounds kind of dumb, believe it or not. There's a lot of people operating that way right now. Yeah. And actually, I it's funny. Um, for every thousand dollars I spend on realtor.com, because I still have a little bit of spend, I lose 500. My conversion rate is 16 percent, which is great but I'm losing my shirt. And uh, so I've been actively, you know, it's different for every market. I'm not bad mouthing those sources, but for me, I've had to cancel them because it's like, this is dumb. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, all right. Uh, you shall use mass email and retargeting. Very interesting. Yes. And that might sound conflicting when we say bots and automated messages are great, but you still have to be a real person. Oh, by the way, you need to be mass emailing and retargeting. Uh, you know, so obviously this, uh, you know, follow boss really allows you to, to leverage this well so that you can stay in front of people, both, you know, in their inboxes, in their, uh, and in front of them on social, uh, which is really important because you can't just randomly call everybody in your database who's nurturing and be there at the right time. You know, you have to be a little more omnipresence to be in front of them. So as you're stacking up these systems as you're stacking up these features, you know, that's what you're doing. And at some point you need to be making sure that you have a good core set of uh, action plans as they're called in follow-up boss. Everybody else would know them as drip campaigns, right? So that you have targeted uh, messaging going out to people and then leveraging that social media as, as you guys do, uh, you know, you Barry, uh, to get that in front of people. I know you're a big proponent of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, Follow a boss still has merge fields for mass emailing that nobody else has. And um, I, I just want to show you one that's totally ridiculous. The email itself is, and it, um, but it represents in my mind, um, let's see, batch emails. So let's see. Uh, wait, I probably should have had this ready beforehand. All right. Okay, so here's one. So it's, it's <laughs> I recognize got, that. You got kids. So you know, is this not so-and-so's email, right? I had a note, you were looking for a home. We had you looking, and this is the last house this guy looked at. And so that's a merge field. Yep, that's and huge. Sometimes I don't have the last house they looked at, so I just add the city and the area after it. So if, it, if there's nothing there, it says, we had you looking in the vicinity of Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads. If I have the address, it merges the address. And I tell them, you know, respond one if you still like it. And I say, please, but then look at this. <laughs> right. Just randomly, I just put the last house viewed or at, actually, I think this is the last five that they viewed. Well, what's interesting about this is this guy saw this, thought to himself, man, I remember that house. And then boom, triggers an alert because he's clicked it. He's now come back after, you know, a couple of weeks of being silent that's why email marketing is such a big deal. And you, you know, the merge fields that follow a boss provides are second to none. 
It's funny. People say, people say email marketing is dead. I mean, I've been hearing that for the last 20 years and uh, people still open emails and still respond to them. And uh, yeah, you, you have to send a lot more of them than you ever did before. Um, yeah. Oh, they have a webinar, right? Uh Oh, we don't have a webinar. Oh, we don't. Okay. I thought we were getting the hook from off stage. Um, SendGrid though, Dan, walk us through how to do that. Walk us through how to integrate uh, SendGrid, Dan. Yeah. So, so basically like I, I would probably guess that maybe like 90% of our clients don't put together a, a regular newsletter. And I think that's, it's a missed opportunity. I think I just made that number up. So it might be a little bit higher or lower, um, but we, you know, we could check the product stats and I think just, it, you know, maybe if you're not a writer, if you're not the kind of person that wants to do it, I mean, maybe make a video and send that out, or maybe you can find someone in your team or someone you can pay to do it. But you know, again, like this, these are people you own that are in your database. How can you just be communicating with them, building that relationship, like educating them a little bit, entertaining them like Barry is, you know, putting in these funny gifts and stuff like that. Um, but then once you've decided to do this, like this regular newsletter, there, there's several tools you can use. And like uh, SendGrid is basically like an API for sending like a lot of emails and you can get a cheap account with them for, I think it's like 10 or $15 a month and connect that to follow-up boss that then allows you to send practically unlimited emails and they help protect your reputation. So you never need to even log into that system again. Once it's set up, it's all just happening through follow-up boss. It's really easy to, to send through follow-up boss. Um, there's also even a couple of cool things we do. Like we can send it from each individual, one of your agents versus like just coming from you. Um, and then we can also include spouses and things like that, partners on the same email. So it gets sent to them both, which is an interesting thing because then you both know that you got it and you can talk about it or you can reply back to everyone. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then MailChimp is the other big integration we have uh, for email marketing. We're also integrated with things like BombBomb and Happy Grasshopper is another one uh, that's been integrated as well. Um, but yeah, I think Sangrid and just hooking that into your follow-up boss. But more importantly, like whatever tech you use, I just think like a newsletter, like send it out once per month, um, tell people about what's going on in the market, what you're seeing and just, yeah, pr try and provide a little bit of entertainment and stuff in there as well. I, yeah. I want to make the, I want to make the point between um, having what is polished and pre-formatted in terms of emails versus what looks like I just wrote you something. If you send a newsletter and you send marketing, fancy uh, designed stuff, that's great. It also teaches those leads that when you write an email, even if it is automated and it's, you know, it's, it's pre-formatted, but it looks like you wrote it, it teaches them the difference from your company between the glossy produced stuff and when I'm trying to communicate with you. So it can actually help your answer rate. Yeah. I like to write my mass emails. Um, that one that I showed you guys is actually really long for me. Normally I like to write them like a text message. So yeah. And the longer and uglier my subject line of the email, the better open rates I have because nobody would automate a long, ugly subject line. You know, what I mean? <laughs> right. you know that agent that works with like, hey, let me know when you can go to the house. I'll bring the lockbox. You know, what I'm I hate that. And nothing in the body that drives me bananas. <laughs> let me know. Hey, dude, I'm telling you that that uh, for a mass email works really, really well. That's great. <laughs> nobody would ever do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh man, I know this one all too well. Thou shalt not change CRMs every year. Yeah, uh, that's not just self-serving because obviously we're doing a follow-up boss webinar here, right? But it it literally is something you know that I experience obviously in coaching and training. Uh, it as a, there's a so I used to be a glass blower, right? I went to to school for sculpture, and there's a there's a there's a phrase uh, which is a poor craftsman blames his tools, and so it's kind of the same thing when you're looking at CRMs. If your agents aren't productive, if your leads aren't converting, if you're not being profitable, it probably isn't which CRM you're using. Uh, stick with, when you have a powerful tool like this, right? Uh, you, you, you need to check first your implementation, your organization and your consistency. And yeah. if you tweak those things, uh, you you don't need to move around. And, and these things take, you know, part of what we're talking about here uh, is that it takes layers upon layers of iteration and, and work to refine this CRM to where it 
it be, you know, becomes such a powerful tool for you. And you can't do that if you keep hopping around. Right. Because nobody's yeah. going to fix it for like, you, nobody's going to sell you something that magically creates you a super productive business. If you find that, you let me know. What was that quote? A poor craftsman blames his tools. Blames his tools. Yeah, that could be on a follow up boss shirt. <laughs> um, but no, but that. So with my role at Wailopo, I, in the early days, I changed CRMs every year. Um, to help with the integration. And this last time I came back to follow up boss and my team made me promise like no more. And Dan sent me the most amazing um, Simpsons gif, like, or like no YouTube clip of like um, Homer coming back for his job, uh, Homer Simpson. Um, I forgot the exact tenor, but it made me laugh so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is, you're going to lose data when you do it. Um, okay. And um, I just tell people it's going to suck for a month. It's going to suck for a month, um, and but it's worth it when you're, um, you know, when you're inefficient. Yeah. And advice for us about switching CRMs? Yeah, we see, I mean, obviously we see it every day, like people switching to us or sometimes they switch away to other things. Um, I would just say, like, I think you really want to think about um, switching once either in like a five-year period or a 10-year period, right? So it's like... The, but the reality is, honestly, there are some bad systems that haven't kept up, kept up with the times. They, they don't have great customer service and not trying to bag anyone. If you're on a system that you're not happy with and your team's not happy with it, you should move no matter when you move to them, you know, because like just the problems are going to continue, right? But if, um, yeah, I think if you're with a good company that has, you know, service and they're innovating and that kind of stuff, you really want to aim for every 10 years. Like, why would you want to go through this? Like, let's focus on more important stuff um, and so, yeah, I think that's the ideal time frame. Like pick a company that you trust and you can stay with for 10 years. I think that's, that's the best scenario, really. Well, the grass being greener on the other side is a myth. The grass is green where you water the lawn, right? And so, you know, if, if people, I used to change lead gen systems every year because it wasn't working and it wasn't working because I wasn't using it correctly. And so, um, you know, this, I think this is really highlighted a lot for our users and, or for the people that are listening on this webinar, what do they do now? So first talk to the follow up boss users, both of you, or one of you that are like watching this and they're like, man, I got to level up. And then also the people that, um, aren't using follow up boss and aren't happy. Um, you know, what, what advice would you give them? Uh, do they start with an, commandment number one, right? And go like, what would you guys recommend? Um, you could almost do that. You could go through here and say, okay, does my CRM allow me to prioritize my follow-up in an efficient way, right? In this case, follow-up us with smart lists and, you know, all the different ways that you can do that. Uh, does it, does it allow for call routing for dialing? Does it allow for recording? Then we go down to task. Does it allow me to use or not use my tasking efficiently and uh, logically, right? So what does the system allow you to do or not do? Uh, does what you're using have all the features that you need and you just aren't leveraging them? Or have you now used your system to the point where what you have is now presenting clear limitations to your ability to further refine and use and grow with your system. Perfect, yeah. love it, love it. All right, well, uh, this has been super, super insightful, um, and a lot of use. A lot of folks got a lot out of this. Um, if they need to reach you, Dale, what's the best way to reach you? Dale at smartinsidesales.com. Super easy to find. And obviously, if you're a follow-up boss member, I, I don't think you could avoid seeing my face if you're in the Facebook group. Right. And Dan, do you just want to go ahead and put your cell phone number in the chat? I'm just kidding. Yeah, let me just, just get your number here. Um, yeah, just Dan at followupboss.com if you want to reach me. I'm a little bit behind on my email, but uh, yeah, I can definitely get you there. And yeah, I love the idea of using this as a checklist. I think everyone's situation is a little bit different. So yeah, just... I'm sure there's some opportunities in there for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, guys, always a pleasure to hang out with the both of you. I know I learned a few things, so I appreciate it and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thanks so much.
All right. Thanks, Gary. See you guys. Thank <laughs> you.